There we go. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Handmade Hero, the show where we code a complete game live on stream. No engines, no libraries, it's just us. Uh, and we do all of the programming on the game, so every last little bit, uh, anything in the game that needs to get done, we do it, and we show exactly how it gets done. So what we're doing right now is we're actually working on kind of the last piece of our asset system. It's the memory management. And I talked a little bit yesterday about the kinds of things that we need to do with this asset system. Uh, and today I wanted to kind of do a very simple implementation of it just so people could kind of see the very basic uh, nature of it. Um, and then from there we'll kind of move on to what we sort of think we might need to do for a more serious shipping version, right? Uh, and so yesterday I kind of prepped the code for it and today I'll just go ahead and do sort of the obvious thing. And off we go. All right, if you would like to code along with me, today is day 158. Uh, you can go ahead and unzip day 157 source code into a directory, and that is the source code that I'm starting with today. Uh, and so I will go ahead and get started. And what we can do today, you know, there are some questions in the pre-stream. Someone was asking if you can just use virtual memory to solve this problem uh, with of the of the address spaces and so on. And I was saying that, well, um, you know, if you if you want to require a 64-bit uh, address space for the game, that's totally, you know, that, that could be. Um, but if not, then you run the risk of blowing out the page table, like, like running out of space in the, in the virtual page table in Windows. Uh, you've got like other issues to worry about in 32-bit that make it maybe potentially not such a good idea. Now, we've never decided that we have to ship a 32-bit version of Handmade Hero, right? So I don't want to say, oh, you know, don't do that or, or whatever because we need to ship 32-bit version. I don't know. You know, when it comes time to ship Handmade Hero, we can, you know, sort of think about things like that. So, well, I guess what I'd say there is, you know, we could decide to just program primarily to 64-bit and then worry about downgrading to 32-bit uh, at the end of the project when we want to ship it, if we decide we need to. You know, that's not the end of the world. You can do that sort of stuff. Uh, our code will not be architected in such a way as to make that an impossible thing to do. Um, but like I said, I, I don't know. You know, I don't know if we want to do that or not. It's certainly something that's a plausible decision these days. Like you could very well make reasonable money on a game that only supported 64-bit operating systems. But at the same time, it's like, well, you know, are you willing to potentially give up a certain segment of the market who just simply can't play the game now because it's, it's only 32-bit, right? Because we know it's out there. We know 15% of the Steam users don't have 64-bit operating systems, right? And so it's just something to think about there. But what I could show here, since I already said, like, I want to do one version of this system uh, that's very basic, just so you can kind of see what the idea is, what I could do is show you how to do it, uh, doing it that way with the 64-bit uh, memory space, that, you know, something that would work with 64-bit memory space for sure, but that probably wouldn't work so well in 32-bit. And then, you know, we can maybe move on from there. That way, people who want to do it that way can see how to do it. It's very, very straightforward. Uh, you've already seen the virtual alloc call, and that's really all you really need is virtual alloc and virtual free. Um, so I can show you how to do that. And maybe that's what to do today, because like I said, we need to build the simple version first anyway. So here's where we're at. Here's the asset system, right? Uh, and if we run the asset system, I've intentionally, oops, we already loaded that. I've intentionally made it so that we really constrained the memory for the asset system. So that because it's not capable of doing any of this virtual memory stuff that I've talked about, uh, what happens now is as soon as I try to instantiate a hero, we immediately hit the assertion that says we're out of space in the asset system, right? You can see here, this, it's on a push size call in the arena. So basically what happens is the load bitmap call tries to load in some of the hero assets. It goes to do the push size and it's just plain out of memory in the arena. Like that's the end of it, right? And so what are you gonna do, right? <clears throat> so if we want to try to address that problem, what we would need to do is we'd need to start coming up with ways of seeing whether or not we're running out of memory. And if we are running out of memory, we have to evict assets, uh, you know, older assets or something so that we can ensure that uh, we always have enough memory to load in new assets that we know that we're going to need shortly, right? 
So let's go ahead and change first to doing an allocation scheme that just gets the memory from the operating system and then releases the memory back to the operating system every time that we want to load an asset, okay? Uh, because we can do that very easily by going through Handmade Platform. And on a 64-bit operating system, this is probably something you could just go ahead and ship. Like, I don't suspect you would have a lot of problems with it. Virtual alloc should probably be reasonably fast um, on, uh, you know, on, on Windows, I would think. I, I don't know. We can certainly time it and, and make sure that that's the case. But if we wanted to here, right, we could just go ahead and say that our platform API was going to get the ability to generically get memory from the operating system and return memory from the operating system, right? Uh, and that would look something like uh, platform, you know, allocate memory uh, and platform deallocate memory. And uh, we could actually leave these in here as well for another reason, which is that one thing we might want to do a, a little later on when I kind of wrap up memory stuff, because we're going to go over a few things uh, sort of towards the end of the engine work. Another thing I can show you how to do once we have the concept of platform allocate memory and deallocate memory, right, is we can go ahead and make it so that instead of allocating all the memory up front in the game, we can make it so that it just grows ad infinitum. So that if you want to do a run of handmade era where you just say, you know what, use as much memory as you want, just keep on going, have a party, uh, we could do that, right? Um, it's actually really easy. We, wouldn't, we don't really have to change any of the code uh, that we've got. Uh, it will all just work. They're just a couple of minor modifications. And since I know that people ask about that a lot, it's something I could show. Uh, so I'm not even going to call these debug uh, because I'm just going to say that we may just allow them to be actual platform calls. And, you know, whether we actually ship a version that allows it to ever call it, uh, I don't know if we'll do that or not. But point being, it'll be fine with me uh, either way. Uh, so let me show you how these would work. They're really, really straightforward. Uh, most of you probably already know what that's going to look like. Really all this is, is <clears throat> we would take uh, and, uh, and add in here uh, some kind of a platform, allocate memory call, and all it would do was return you a pointer uh, when you pass it uh, a size, right? Uh, so you would call in and you would pass it a size, uh, like so, like that, uh, and uh, then... <clears throat> We would obviously need uh, the corresponding deallocate call, which just does a standard free, right? Uh, so here we go. This is going to be platform allocate memory. Uh, and we're going to need the same thing for deallocate memory, right? And all that's going to do is take that pointer uh, and uh, create the, the corresponding call, right? So if we wanted to be able to get more memory for the operating system on demand, that's the only thing that really needs to happen. Uh, it's very, very straightforward. And in order to implement that in Windows, again, you've pretty much already seen the call, uh, the calls happen that we would need. They are also really straightforward. So again, this is really just for everyone who's watched Handmade Heroes since the beginning, this should be a total walk in the park. Uh, really, really, really straightforward. So if you take a look at how this works, uh, we'd have our platform allocate memory, platform uh, deallocate memory, and there they are, Win32 allocate memory, Win32 deallocate memory. Uh, and so we really don't even have to do anything new. You've already seen it. It's just this virtual alloc idea, right? Um, and uh, I assume we also did virtual free at some point. Yes, we did. Right. And so if you take a look at how these work, again, super, super basic. We just have a call to the operating system that says we would like to allocate some virtual memory. We go ahead and, you know, ask what the size of it is. We know that that's been passed in now. So it's just whatever the user asked for. Uh, we can commit it, right? Uh, and then we return that. And if it fails, it fails. We return a null pointer. Doesn't matter. It still works just fine. The caller then knows they couldn't get any more memory from the operating system, which is what we would want. Same is true for deallocating memory. And again, these are just so simple. There's nothing to them. Uh, we don't even need to think about this API. It's just totally basic. And uh, there's really, no yeah, there's really absolutely nothing to it. Uh, so we've got the virtual free. Virtual free takes whatever the memory is and releases it, right? That's it. Uh, and we could double check there. I don't know if virtual free allows you to pass zero pointers, uh, but we could double check. 
That's all she wrote. Um, really, really straightforward. So if we come in here and add those to our uh, platform API table, we've got allocate memory and deallocate memory, 32 allocate memory and 32 deallocate memory, right? And that would be all we would need to do. Now we can just go ahead and allocate and deallocate memory all we want uh, and off you go. So uh, there's a couple things to think about here, right? Temporarily, uh, if we did this, we would no longer be able to use our looped live code editing correctly, right? Because when we do those virtual allox virtual freeze, um, those pieces of memory are not going to get written out, right? If you think about it. So when we reload memory, the memory is going to be the same as it was uh, at the end of the loop point, right? Uh, so that's something to think about just, just for a second. Um, I'm going to push forward because we don't care about that particular thing right now, but that's going to be something that we have to address uh, in a little bit if we decided to keep this scheme going. If we replace the scheme with a block allocator, like I was sort of saying, then we don't care because it just gets written out properly. So just keep that in the back of your mind that this would break loop live code editing because we're not saving these buffers out. Now, it's still pretty easy for us to fix that, and you know, that's sort of a separate issue, uh, but yeah. All right, so here we go. Uh, let's go into our handmade asset stuff and show what we would do now to start to, sort of, uh, to, start to address the problem that we were having. So when we do our load bitmap call, um, <clears throat> again, we end up in a situation where doing the load bitmap call we need to make sure that we can actually get the amount of memory that we need. And at the moment, we don't really know very much about, uh, well, we don't really know much about any of this. We don't really know what we can safely free. All we know is how much memory we're actually going to need. And so what I talked about at the end of last stream is that what we need to do here is we need to make there be a safe way we can free enough memory to allow us to load the bitmap that we want to load. And so the question becomes, how much of that, uh, you know, how do we want to approach that problem? We can't just start freeing memory inside load bitmap because load bitmap is called in the middle of frames, which may be using some of the bitmaps that are on our list, right? So we can't very well go and just free some memory arbitrarily because if we were going to free memory arbitrarily like that, uh, we would end up in a bit of a bind. So we have a couple different options, certainly. Uh, we have a couple ways we could choose to try to address that. Um, but, you know, I'm not sure what would be the most efficacious way. One way to address that would be to buffer up all the requests to load bitmaps. Another one would be, and I, I talked about both these, would be to always keep some amount of memory free that's like roughly commensurate, you know, basically... Um, always making sure that we kind of do the allocates and then do the freeze later. And since we're just showing the simplest possible way to do that, I'm going to take the approach that we're not going to hit a hard limit just yet. We're going to have basically a soft limit, if that makes sense. So let me show you how to do that. Uh, inside the asset system, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start tracking how much memory it's actually using, right? So I'm going to make it in uh, U64 here that's like total memory used. Okay, and when we start up, I am going to initialize that uh, so that assets total memory used is zero, right? Pretty straightforward. What I will then do is every time we load something, I'm going to have it go through a call uh, that actually accounts for the memory that it's going to get, right? So something like uh, you know, allocate or acquire asset memory, right? Uh, and in that call, you'll pass the, the game assets thing, uh, and you will pass uh, the size that you wanted. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll just do the allocation there, and we'll increment the amount of memory used by the size, right? So we do something like results equals plat, allocate memory, 
at that size. Uh, and then we will add the size and uh, I guess we should assume that only if we actually allocate it, uh, you know, return that size. Okay? Uh, so that's, that's pretty straightforward, right? Okay. Uh, so that'll do acquire asset memory. And then what we want to do here is do something where we release memory. So we'll do a release asset memory uh, and give it back to the system. So what we'll do there is say, okay, we'll call that. Uh, here's our void pointer, right? And the problem that we'll have here is we actually need to be able to know what the size of that memory actually was, right? So we need to pass the size into our freeing function as well which is kind of a little janky, but you know, we just, that's what we need to track it. So for now, we'll just actually go ahead and pass that in. And so what that'll do is that'll call platform uh, release memory, right? Oops, sorry, uh, deallocate memory rather, with the memory. And assuming that memory was non-zero, right? Uh, we'd also do assets uh, total memory used minus equal size, right? Now, uh, since this is always going to be, is, this is not going to be threaded at the moment, we don't have to worry about that fact. But if we were going to start calling this from multiple threads, we would have to make sure that we actually uh, did sort of a, a, a atomic add or atomic decrement for these. Um, but since we don't currently have any plans to do that, uh, that's actually okay. But just keep that in mind that, you know, that would not be safe if we started calling it from like up in here, it, if load asset work started to do... Uh, you know, stuff with that or, or that sort of thing, if that makes sense. Um, you know, what's kind of interesting here is, I should also put a to-do in here, to-do Casey, this doesn't actually handle uh, the file stream down case, does it? Uh, because the memory stays and so on. So I feel like this actually needs to be something I feel like I feel like this kind of needs to happen regardless or something like that. I th in fact, you know what? I'm just going to do this. I think what we actually wanted is this. It's the final state, uh, but assuming that the file read failed, uh, we would do something here where we're like, you know, if there was an error reading the file, we should put a bogus data in there or whatever, right? Like maybe just zero the memory, something like that. Uh, you know, this. I feel like that's the same thing to do. Zero size. Do we have a zero size? I feel like we do. We do. Uh, anyway, moving on. So inside plat, uh, what what is that actually called there? Inside plat, we should have that pointer. Obviously, we don't. Oh, it's called platform. Sorry, platform. There we go. Okay, so here we've got a thing that will allocate memory for us, and here we've got a thing that will release memory for us, right? And so what we can do is we can do something that allows us to quickly allocate and free our memory. So what we can do here is say, okay, uh, in this case, when we want bitmap memory, uh, instead of doing this push size, we'll just do an acquire asset memory. We'll pass it the game assets and the memory size, right? Uh, and the same thing would be true inside our sound thing. Instead of doing the push size, we just do a acquire asset memory and we pass it the assets and the size that we actually wanted. Right? Uh, and that's pretty straightforward. And now our game would just run and it would just get more memory from the operating system. So now everything just kind of works and we don't have that problem anymore, but we still do have the problem of we're actually just taking an arbitrary amount of memory right? Uh, which is not what we wanted, certainly. Uh, so let's go uh, continue down this path. So now what we need to do is we need to take a look at that actual amount of, of asset memory that we have, that we are actually using, and potentially start to free things in the case where it gets a little bit too high, right? And so how would we do that? Well, what we'd want to do is do this at a control point during a frame where we know that we don't have any risk of anyone using any of the assets or how, like being you know currently working with any of the assets right uh, so if we if we went into handmade.cpp uh, and we basically you know at the end of the frame when everything is all said and done 
uh, and we end all the temporary memory and everything is kind of cleaned up, right? Uh, what we can do at that point is say, okay, now would be a good time for the asset system to, to jettison any assets that it thinks it needs to to get it back down to a reasonable working set size, right? So we could do like uh, free assets as necessary, right? Or like evict assets as necessary. Uh, and we would call that uh, the trans state uh, assets, we would just do it like that, right? And so what we are essentially doing is creating a fixed point in time so that we can again avoid having to make everything super multi-threaded locking like stuff for no apparent reason. Uh, we can just make it so there's a particular point in time after everything all has been done for the frame where we just allow the asset system a little bit of quiet time for itself uh, to come in here and evict assets as necessary, right? So that's it. And what evict assets as necessary is going to do is it's just going to sit in a loop, right? It's just going to sit in a loop uh, trying to figure out <clears throat> how it can get uh, below uh, total memory used, right? So while total memory used is greater than whatever the, the target memory is, right? Uh, target memory used, like some, some amount of memory we specify, right? While it's greater than that, we try to free an asset, right? We try to, to free something. And we'll, you know, assuming we could free it, uh, then we do. If not, we break and it's like an illegal code path that's like, this should never happen, right? But, you know, <clears throat> if it should for some reason happen, we want to know about it uh, so we could fix it because that's obviously a bug. So what we need to do here is basically get uh, the least recently used asset, right? So we need something here that's like, uh, something like, uh, you know, the asset slot, right? Um, something that would be like get least recently used asset, or maybe it's a slot index, right? Get least recently used asset, you know? We would call that and it would return us the slot index um, of something that we could free. So assuming that that slot index comes back as something other than the zero asset, we would then grab that slot, right? And say assets, oops. We would say that that particular slot, uh, we would like to basically shut that asset down. So like free the memory uh, associated with that asset. So we would say evict asset, right? Um, I guess we would just do evict asset directly of slot index. And then the, that would probably all be in one thing, right? Uh, internal void, evict asset. And this just gets the asset out of the system, right? It just says, go away, Mr. Asset. Uh, you know, you, oops, uh, you don't really belong. Uh, <clears throat> you don't belong anymore. It's kind of like, you know, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. This asset's not allowed to play with the reindeer games anymore on account of his horrible nose mutation, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, so we pass in the slot that we want here, uh, and then this evict asset call will take care of getting an asset from a state of being loaded to a state of being freed, right? Uh, and what we would want to do there is we'd want to say, okay, uh, the asset slots, let's grab out whatever the slot is. This is where that asset lives. We want to check its state uh, to assert that the state is in fact loaded because there is no other state that is actually allowed to be evicted. Locked assets can't be evicted. Queued assets are not there yet and unloaded assets were not even uh, scheduled to be there. So at the very least, it's going to be an error to try to evict an asset uh, that isn't even uh, loaded, right? So assuming the slot state is loaded, really all we need to do is transition the slot state to being unloaded uh, and free the memory, right? Uh, so in order to do that, all we have to do is, again, use that uh, release asset memory call. And so our problem here is going to be we don't actually know how big of an asset this actually was when we release it. So we want to do something that makes it easy for us to pass this size parameter here, right? Memory is pretty easy for us to pass. Uh, because we kind of know that whichever kind of asset it was, we, you know, we had the memory in there. And the other, the other thing we can do, too, um, is we can kind of make that a little easier on ourselves by, by making the asset slot 
memory situation a little more regular. Um, that's something we probably should do. I kind of feel like we should unify the way the memory goes in here. Uh, I, I kind of want to do that. So let's actually do that as well. So what I want to do is say, okay, we'll free the slot memory like this. And there we just need to know, uh, I guess, what the size actually would have been. And here we kind of have this problem too of like not, again, we kind of get back into a situation where we want to know whether this thing is a bitmap or a sound because we kind of want to know where the memory would be. And if we just knew which one it was, we could just do it instead of having to unify them any further. Um, hmm, hmm, I say. So it's a little bit frustrating, right? It's a little bit frustrating to me uh, just because I'm not entirely certain. I'm not entirely certain how I want to approach that. Let's take a look at the file formats. I want to see how it's actually done in here. So it just stores the data offset, but that's it uh, of, the, of the data in the file. And then we always, we're, we always like compute the rest of the information uh, from residual stuff. And you know, I, I just don't know what I want to do about, about this aspect of it. I feel like there's been enough things so far that we just want to be able to, you know, we want to be able to know whether something's a bitmap or a sound, and I'd kind of studiously avoided that uh, so far, but it seems like something that we would like to take care of, you know? It seems like something that it would just be nice to know anytime you look at an asset slot, uh, which one it's going to be. And I don't really know, like, you know, we could have even packed that state in here, right? Um, so we have these, we could also do asset state sound, uh, and asset state sound could be like, you know, just one of the high bits. Uh, of the thing, an asset state bitmap could be one of the highest states of the thing. Uh, and it's just, a, it's a little janky because then people have to remember to actually set these uh, when they transition to loaded or locked. They don't need to do it any other time. Um, but it seems like something. It seems like something. Uh, let's take a look. Let's just see what would happen uh, if we were going to do that, right? because uh, you can kind of see that it's only in these two places, right? And so the final state would just be like, oh, you know, uh, it's a bitmap or a sound. And when we load the final state, now we know what's actually in there uh, and we don't have to do, you know, any other kind of monkey business, right? Um, we just kind of know. So I don't know, that does seem kind of interesting, right? And maybe I'll leave it that way. Uh, and so, Nobody else ever looks at asset state loaded, right? Um, besides the people who actually get the thing out. So all we would have to do uh, is, is make sure that in here uh, we just mask it off, right? So we do something like um, get state, like that, uh, of the slot, and uh, we would make inline 32 get state uh, from an asset slot would just return whatever the slot state was masked out uh, by whatever the those bits were, right? Uh, so instead we would do, you know, just take the bottom bits like so. Uh, so that's certainly something we could do. Again, I don't know that it's a good idea, uh, but it's certainly an idea. Uh, and we could just say that, you know, asset state uh, mask even we could just say uh, that the bottom eight is that asset state and then the top is for whatever we want, right? So yeah, little janky, right? But gets the job done. So there we go, we, we would have a way now of knowing which one it's gonna be. Uh, and so we could just now check to see is asset state loaded, assuming it is, we unload it. Uh, and then really all we have to do now is figure out how much memory it takes for this particular slot uh, and and release that memory, right? So in order to do that, we need to, com to, to compute that size. Uh, so we want to do something like get 
size of asset and that would take you know whatever the, the asset index actually is like this uh, and maybe we would also pass when we do get size of asset uh, we would pass whichever one uh, it actually is right so we'd go ahead and say like oh okay we've got um, asset sound and asset bitmap right so what we would do is we'd say uh, there'd be another thing which is asset state like type mask or something like this um, which we can use to just grab just that part right so we can say all right you know get type of slot uh, so we also have the ability to get that there we go and handmade file formats not what I wanted but I wanted this and I wanted to add that call there we go so we can say get type of s of the asset slot and that's just the asset slot type mask there uh, and this could be the state mask just to make them a little bit more explicit about which was which right pretty straightforward stuff I guess technically it's all that so okay so I'm not totally unhappy with that I just don't love it um, but you know you don't always love all the code right uh, that's that's not the way that goes that's not how programming usually goes uh, so anyway if we go ahead and make get size of asset be something that can tell us that you know for a specific asset slot you know how big it actually is uh, based on you know assuming that you actually know what the type is right um, we can go ahead and do this uh, where we say all right let's take a look at the type I guess we only have two types so we just say you know if the type uh, is a sound it'll compute it one way uh, else it'll compute it the other way uh, and we'll assert you know that the type is a bitmap at that point in case we add something else and like forget to fix this or something at least that way we'll get an assertion in there and it'll be fine so what we'd want to do is we'd want to do exactly the the stuff that happens here right we'd want to be able to do a thing that computes uh, the memory size like so so we'd have a memory index memory size uh, and then we would have it uh, do whatever the correct things are for sound uh, versus uh, versus bitmap okay and so looking at what how that actually works uh, it's it's just going to be you know this code for the bitmap where is that at there it is it's just going to be this code for the bitmap uh, so we're going to get you know uh, that info dim uh, times the other info dim uh, times four right oops uh, that's really all that's even computing so pretty straightforward uh, and I uh, just need to be able to get that info uh, so it would just be something that, that kind of works like this right uh, so we'd go ahead and take the slot index uh, of the asset we would then uh, grab the bitmap out of that and compute it very simple uh, and we can also make sure that that's always what we actually use here as well um, right we can always do something uh, where we would do memory index memory size uh, equals you know uh, get size of asset uh, so that we kind of already always know uh, that we're dealing with with the asset directly so we do get size of asset we would pass it the slot index that we're talking about here which is just id.value uh, we or we always know that we're dealing with a bitmap so we don't actually need to do any determination there um, and so that we could just always use so we know that the size is the same uh, that we're not like doing two different computations uh, of what that size is which is kind of nice right and so here it would be the same thing right we'd go ahead and replace that so in here we'd, we'd actually do the, the channel count times the channel size sort of a thing uh, and I don't know if channel size is channel size even used in it. It is, yeah. Okay. Uh, so we would do something up here where we would uh, where we would compute those. But then what we would do when we actually go to do the memory size is we would call get size of asset, and uh, that's what we would use for the memory size going forwards. And it would be the sound, right? Uh, so doing that, we would just do again grabbing that info out, hha sound. Uh, and there's the sound again so in order to compute the memory size we just need to figure out uh, I guess we don't know that's just info in both cases yeah 
so same exact thing as the bitmap case. Use the info that we look up oops, to, uh, to figure that out. Uh, and we can do something here, you know, again, I don't want to be doing lots of computations that I don't know if they're being done in the same, uh, the same way in multiple places. It just makes me a little bit nervous, right? Um, you can see that the channel size is, is getting used in multiple places here and kind of the pitch was being used the same way there too. And so one thing that that kind of, uh, you know, suggests to me is that maybe what you would want to do is you'd want to have a thing that's like, you know, asset uh, memory size or something like this that actually returns a little bit more. So it's like, you know, total size is one of the things, uh, but then like, you know, uh, something like a row size, like that's, a, that's separate, and that would return like the pitch um, in that case or whatever, something like that, uh, or the channel size in the case of a sound. That seems like maybe a little bit slightly better idea to me, right? Um, and we can, you know, before we were saying U32s for these, so maybe we'll keep it to that and say that they have to be U32s instead of being able to be 64 bit. Um, but so if we did that, we could say, okay, asset memory size, the result of the asset memory size computation is going to include these other things, right? Uh, so let's see here, there we go. Uh, and so now we could actually do something more like this, where, you know, we get the bitmap out and then we say, all right, uh, you know, I guess we don't care about the width and the height so much, uh, but we do care about computing the pitch. So what we'd say is the result row size is going to be that that sort of, um, you could even call it something a little bit better, like section size or something like that, right? Uh, so if the thing has multiple pieces that computes that. Uh, so we do section size, we go ahead and do that, that safe truncate um, <clears throat> for the width and the height, like so, right? Uh, and then when we do uh, section size, uh, we can just use the width from that. Uh, and then when we do total size, it's just going to be the section size uh, times the height, right? So that allows us to do that computation in a way that now, when we return that as a result, uh, we can actually just rely on that to do all of the stuff that we actually wanted it to do in terms of the memory layout, which is a little bit uh, better in my opinion, right? Uh, so now we call this, when we get the uh, information back, we can set the pitch uh, equal to the section size, right? Um, and we can set uh, the, the memory size equal to the total size. I guess we don't need size uh, because we already know it's a size, right? So that's just, you see what I did there? Like I just, I just wasn't comfortable having that kind of duplicated code because I was afraid that there might be times when that would cause an error. Like somebody would, you know, maybe go in and change that code and not realize that it was done in two different places. Uh, and you know, you just, uh, over time, you kind of try to take those things out one by one because uh, it just makes the code just more reliable as you go. Uh, you don't need to be paranoid about it, right? Um, but you do kind of want to spot those things and just take care of them when you see them because uh, tends to pay back uh, later if you're, if you're kind of, uh, you know, you're, you're kind of helping yourself out basically, right? Uh, so there's that section size uh, and uh, that's going to be the, the sample count times the size of a sample. And then the total size is just going to be however many channels there are times uh, that section size, right? Uh, so that's about it. I think that's all we really need to do there. Uh, I'm just going to go down here and again change this to uh, do asset memory size like so. And then channel size can just be driven off of that. Uh, so that's going to be size section, like so. Uh, and then the uh, the memory size would be the same. Memory size equals size total, like that. Uh, and I think that's, a, that's kind of a more sane way to do that. Okay, uh, let's take a look at how this goes. I don't know why I typed slate there, uh, but <clears throat> it has been fixed. Let's see, conversion from, U32, conversion from U32 to S16. Uh, so this is actually, I guess, a safe truncate to U16, right? Um, although, wait, conversion from to S16. Uh, I guess we don't really have a safe truncate for that, do we? I don't feel like we do. Uh, platform, safe truncate. Yeah, we don't uh, have one for truncating to an S16. I wonder why we didn't do that before. 
Seems like you would want to do that, right? Um, so I'm going to go ahead and def def define that there where we can actually, you know, do something that's going to do uh, a safe truncate. Um, and in order to do that again, I'll just do uh, 65536 divided by 2. So I'll do the two bounds there. Why did it not leave that up? Leave that up. There we go. Um, 65536 divided by 2. Paste. Uh, so what I want to do here is I just want to say, like, okay, as long as it's within the bounds um, of an, uh, you know, an int 16, you can go ahead and, and truncate it. Uh, and we never expect our pitch to be that big, but we just want to make sure. Okay. So off we go. That gets done. Um, yeah. We need to make sure that the state objects, I guess, uh, since they're going to be ORed together, they're now actually not asset state values. Um, let's see, get size of asset. This is going to be asset memory size now. And we do size total, so we can free it. Uh, and the slot memory is now the only thing that we don't have. Uh, let's see, anything else? Target memory used is a function of assets. Um, and so let's go up here to and set uh, target memory used to something reasonable. Uh, well, I guess we'll call that size. There we go. And so now really all I have to do is, is fix, uh, fix this guy so that we know where the actual memory is. Uh, and in order to do that, I think I can just do a get type of the slot, right? Uh, and figure out where the memory is like, like this, right? I can just say like, okay, uh, if get type slot uh, equals sound, then we know that the, the slot sound dot channels or uh, samples uh, zero is the start of the memory. And if, uh, if not, it's just a bitmap memory, right? So I'm going to do an assertion here as well. I'll do an assertion that just ensures uh, that whatever the, <clears throat> you know, a case we add against something and, and, and this doesn't work, we want to make sure that's okay. So now we have only one really problem remaining, which is get least recently used asset. Uh, doesn't actually, you know, we don't actually know what that's going to do. So I'm going to go ahead temporarily and just disable that because uh, I want to test uh, all that, those changes we made and make sure that, that nothing has gone horribly wrong um, because sometimes things go horribly wrong. Uh, but we look okay here. Everything still seems to be loading okay. Um, and it's all good, right? So there we go. So now what we need to do is, last thing we need to do uh, is we need to take the... Uh, we need to add something to our asset system that lets us know what the least recently used asset is. So I'm going to start again by doing the simplest possible thing because this is kind of the, the low end version of, of, of uh, the system. We're kind of doing everything as simple as possible. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce uh, basically like a, uh, a sort of a doubly linked list kind of a scheme uh, to go through our assets. And this is not a particularly good way of doing this. Uh, so we're going to have to look at something a little bit saner. Um, well, you know what? I could start, I could probably start by doing something saner, to be honest. Uh, it's not actually entirely out of the question. Um, let's think about that for a second. I mean, fundamentally what I want to do here, right? is I want to know when we have an asset that is, you know, whatever the asset that was least recently asked for in a call to say load bitmap or load sound, right? So we're looking for something that's fundamentally like a heap kind of a data structure where you've just got a, you can pull out somebody whose sort of number is, is the worst, right? And uh, I'm just trying to think of like what the easiest way would be to go about doing that. Um, and you know, my, 
my gut instinct for the simplest way to do it is to just thread some a linked list through it. But the problem with doing that is it, it takes a lot more memory than we really need it to, you know? Um, it's definitely kind of wasteful. But I suppose it's not a big deal if we actually only did it for the assets that were actually loaded, which of course are the only ones we actually need. So one thing that we could do um, is we could make it so that the assets had a little bit of a header on them that allows that, that threading to occur, right? So what I could do is I could do um, something like this. And in fact, I suppose this would have been something we could have used too to store the size of the asset memory as well if we didn't want to have to compute it. But it seems like you should just compute it because since we know it, there's no point in, in, uh, uh, in storing it. Um, but basically what I'm thinking is, okay, so let's do the simplest possible thing here. Uh, if I was to go ahead and introduce a, uh, uh, a loaded asset list, right? Um, or I guess I'll call it a sentinel here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a doubly linked list that just runs through our assets. And we're literally going to do the dumbest possible thing, which is that every time an asset's used, we're going to move it to the front of the list, which means that the end of the list will always be our least recently used asset. Right? Uh, super, super simple. Uh, again, really, really uh, nothing, nothing to it. And you know, it kind of even looks like memory could have gone right here. Uh, so I don't know, if we keep this, it may be really stupid for me to have introduced that like computation thing because we could probably just not do that. Uh, but what are you gonna do? Programming is not the kind of thing where you always know exactly what you should do when you start. Uh, you gotta kind of get in there and take a look. So anyway, uh, if I was to do that, all I would really have to do uh, is when you go ahead and do asset memory size, right? Uh, when it actually does that computation, I just go ahead and add to the total, right, uh, the size of one of these asset memory headers. Uh, and now I just know uh, that any time after, you know, any time I allocate one of these things, I can just stick the asset memory header at the end uh, of this thing and be done with it, right? And it's, and it's pretty straightforward. Uh, so what I could do, for example, is when we do, you know, this acquire asset memory thing here, right? What I could do is say, all right, let's also say that um, in the, oops, where do we actually load this guy? Acquire asset memory, memory size right there. Uh, so what I wanna do is I wanna, I guess I wanna make this kind of like total um, data and section. Uh, so that actually total is going to equal result.data plus uh, that extra header size, right? So I want to make it so, because I, I want to be able to know how much I'm actually supposed to load as opposed to the little part at the end that's just for the asset memory header, right? So instead it's going to look like this. There you go. Uh, and when I do this, uh, it'll actually just load that memory size bit in there. So instead of, of size total, what it's going to load is just the data, right? And in fact, what I could do is now just kind of get rid of that concept of memory size altogether and actually just access the size thing directly like that, right? And what I can do is I can then say, okay, um, I can add a thing to the work structure, which is like the header for this thing, you know, um, is going to be, uh, The header for this thing is going to be wherever you know the thing actually was plus however big the data was right so it's just going to be uh if i take that the sort of the the bitmap memory right uh and i advance past all of the data that's where the header is going to be right that's basically it uh so pretty straightforward nothing particularly fancy there uh, but that gives me a header if i want one and the same would be true uh, for the sound Right, uh, so if I then go ahead and say, okay, you know, I take the memory, I advance by the size, now I've got a header. And so now this guy, uh, this work at, you know, this, this uh, load asset work thing, this guy can now have uh, an asset memory pointer in it, uh, which is just gonna be the header. And so now there's just a header that we can use for that sort of thing. Okay, so the problem, the thing that makes this not super easy, unfortunately, is we do have one 
sort of caveat, which is that since a lot of these things are, since this thing that's loading the assets in, uh, since we don't actually know, I guess since this thing itself is not really the thing that wants to add stuff to the list, uh, when the thing comes into existence, I guess there's really no, I guess now that I think about it, there's really no reason to actually store that in the asset work. It's really just something that we use directly here, right? When we add the entry in, it's really just something where we're like, okay, you know what? The asset memory header is just a thing that we need to then fill out, right? And we can already add the asset memory header to the list if we want to. Um, so yeah, so I think we're I think we're okay. I think this is fine. I think what we really want to do is just something like this: uh, add asset header uh, to list or something like that. But we're just going to go ahead and say right when we do it, uh, we want to to uh, go ahead and make that happen. So we'll just do something like this, right? Uh, we'll say there's the memory, there's the size uh, structure, uh, and here's the assets structure. So yeah, I think that's what I actually want to do because I don't want it to be happening in a multi-threaded context. I think that would be bad uh, because you don't want a doubly linked list happening in the middle of multi-threaded stuff. It's just a pain in the butt uh, and error, error prone. So let's go ahead and do it this way. Uh, and then we'll just have up here, internal void add asset to list. Uh, and so there we've got our game assets and we have our asset memory header, uh, which is constructed uh, by taking the memory and adding the size. Uh, so that's gonna be void star memory and asset size. What was it called again? Asset memory size. Right, uh, and that will do that computation. When we find one of these headers, adding it is pretty straightforward. If you've never done a doubly linked list before, it's really pretty uh, easy. It's just a little bit weird. I think we may have talked about this uh, on the stream at one point or another. Um, but basically like a doubly linked list uh, is, is really just a list where you have a piece of memory and it's got a previous and a next pointer in it, right? And you've just got all these links uh, like so. And the previous pointer just points to the previous thing. Uh, so, you know, you've kind of, kind of got these things that look like this, right? And the next pointer just points to the one that comes after it, right? And the reason that you use a doubly linked list instead of a singly linked list or some other data structure is if you just have, if you just want to move items around in the list a lot, a doubly linked list gives you all the information that you actually need in order to remove something when all you have is just the link itself, right? Because it tells you who was before it, so you know you can patch this pointer to like point to the next guy, and it tells you who was after it, so you know you can point this point, pointer to point to the next guy, right? So you have all the information you need, whereas in a singly linked list, right? If you're just looking at something like this, if I give you this guy and I say remove him, you have no idea how to get back to this dude, right? Because there is no pointer that goes back to the previous one. So doubly linked lists are kind of this like, you know, um, overkill kind of data structure where it's just like, yeah, you don't even know anything. You just get a link and you can do whatever you want. You can like walk backwards, walk forwards, remove it, do whatever you want, right? So if I wanted to insert this, Right, I've got uh, my asset memory header. Uh, so what I chose to do is I chose to use something called a Sentinel, which is to just have a dummy header. And I include that dummy header, uh, one that is not attached to any asset. I include that dummy header uh, in my actual asset structure so it's always there, right? It's just always there. Uh, and so what I can do is say, okay, we've got the Sentinel, oops, uh, which is this guy. And what I want to do is I want to insert this guy as the first person in the list. So the sentinel's next pointer should point to this guy, right? So sentinel next should point to this guy. That's what I want to have happen, right? 
What that also means is that if Sentinel next, whoever Sentinel next was pointing to previously, whatever the, whatever the guy after the Sentinel next was before, his previous pointer had also better point to me, right? Because I'm putting someone in, I need the next pointer of the Sentinel to point to it, and whoever was previously in that slot needs to point back, right? Um, so I need to hook up the guy this way, like so. You can see how that would work, right? Looking at it a little bit differently, we could say that if we want this guy to come after the Sentinel on the list, we'd say that his previous pointer is the Sentinel, right? And his next pointer is whoever the Sentinel's other next pointer would have been, right? And you can kind of see what I'm doing here, right? I've got a guy who's like kind of uh, job it is to be my main link, right? Here's the Sentinel. And what I want to do is that Sentinel, right, has a previous pointer that points to somebody I don't care about back here. And it's got a next pointer that points uh, to this guy right here, yeah? And what I want to do is I want to insert this thing. And by the way, this previous pointer, right, uh, sorry, this previous pointer points back to the Sentinel, right? So what I want to do if I want to insert someone here is I need to set this pointer to point to me, right? This is the new guy who's coming in. I need to set this pointer to point to me, but I also need to set this pointer to point to me, right? So I need <clears throat> to set up a bunch of pointers. First, I need to set up this guy's next and previous, right? So the previous points to the Sentinel, the next points to whoever the next guy was in the list originally. But then I need to fix up these two pointers, right? Like I sort of was showing here. Uh, so how could I do that though in a slightly more convenient way? So I've got header previous, that equals the Sentinel. I've got header next, that equals the, whoever was next. What I can do now is just say, well, I can just semantically say what I want to have happen, right? My next and previous pointers are now both correct. The only thing that's not correct is that they don't point back to me. So what I can do instead is say, well, the, whoever's next, whoever's ahead of me, their previous pointer should point to me. And who's ever before me, their next pointer should point to me. So I can kind of just write it like I want it to work and not have to think about it much beyond that. So really all I have to do to insert a guy is set their previous and next pointers to point to the people who are on either side of them. And then this little uh, nonsense here, right, takes care of the rest. It goes, who is next? Okay, their previous pointer needs to point to me. Who is previous? Okay, it's next pointer needs to point to me, right? Pretty straightforward. Uh, so that's really all that is. And we could, uh, you know, I could show you here how to write the remove asset header uh, from list as well. Right, um, so remove asset header is pretty basic. Remove asset header from list, uh, it just needs to take, it doesn't even need to take any of this stuff, right? It just needs to take uh, that asset memory header. So if you have that asset memory header and you wanna remove it from the list, again, you can just say what you wanna have happen, right? I have a guy who's before me in the list, right? That's my previous, the guy who's before me. I want his next pointer to point to whoever's after me. So it skips over me now, right? And similarly, I would want my next, who's ever after me, I'd want their previous pointer to point to whoever's before me. But that's it, right? That totally takes me out of the list. Nothing to it, right? Uh, so if we want to now, we can make it so that, okay, we add things. We add asset header to list, which we've got. Uh, we've got remove asset header um, from list as well. Uh, so now we could actually do, well, honestly, we can pretty much finish up. I don't know if we want to go maybe five minutes over and just finish up uh, and just not do the debugging. We'll do the debugging uh, on the next stream, right? But basically that's it. Uh, so what we could do here is we could come back in uh, to our evict asset. When we go to evict the asset right before uh, we release the memory, right? We would do remove asset header from list uh, and we would, uh, again, pass that, that asset header. And really what we would be doing on evict asset here, I suspect, uh, is instead of evicting asset now, what we would do is we'd actually just have the header because the header is the thing that we're gonna have anyway. So we have the asset memory header, there's the header. Uh, the slot index is actually just gonna come from that header, right? Um, and, uh, and so when we do get least recently used asset, what that's actually gonna give us is asset memory header star uh, asset, right? And assuming that asset is not null. And in this case, what we'll say is assuming the asset um, is not equal to the, to that, um, to that sentinel. I'll show you why that is in a second. Loaded asset sentinel. So assuming that the asset isn't, you know, basically our, 
our one that just stays there and, and serves as our, our base point, uh, we evict it. Right? So that's, <clears throat> again, pretty straightforward. We'll go ahead and evict assets that way. Uh, and get recently used asset now no longer has to really be anything fancy. It's just going to be whatever the last thing was. So it's whatever that sentinel was. It's whatever its previous pointer was. That's the last thing in the list, right? Really, really basic. Um, so we just go ahead and, and do that. Uh, and now our eviction code is, is a lot simpler. So when we do our add asset uh, header to list, though, one thing that I should force it to do is it needs to set, uh, in addition to the previous and next, we would like it to set that slot index so we can make sure that that's always valid. So what I want to do here is just introduce also the slot index. Uh, maybe I'll put it right here. Uh, that way, everyone who calls that uh, has to put that slot index in here so that we make sure that it gets initialized. And that's just a little like insurance policy there uh, so that we don't forget. Uh, yeah. So now there's really only one thing that we need to do, um, which is we need to have it reinsert assets into the list whenever they are used. Uh, so whenever someone does a get sound, right? Um, what we would want to do at that point is make sure that we move, uh, so, you know, uh, move asset to front or something like this, right? Or mark asset as recently used. And we would go ahead and give that ID value and the header and whatever else, right, of the thing. Uh, we would go ahead and have that, that work here, right? Um, I'll hold off on that. We've covered a little bit too much ground, I think, today. Uh, so I don't really want to quite do that yet. Um, so let me just take care of any crashiness that we have here. Uh, let's go ahead and fix that first. And, um, <clears throat> oh, right, I have to initialize our little essential there. And then I'll kind of go over that stuff a little bit in the Q&A so that everyone is on the same page. So, uh, again, because I'm using this sentinel here, uh, all of my operations were written assuming that the linked list always has something in it, which is at least the sentinel. So at startup, what we need to do is we need to, to make sure that the sentinel always points back to itself, right? So basically what I'm doing here, just to avoid any kind of, of uh, uh, difficulty, oops, yeah. Uh, in order to avoid any kind of more coding complexity, uh, what I'm doing at startup, right, is I'm starting us up with a list that just points to itself, right? So here's our sentinel, uh, and we've got a next and previous pointer, and all I'm doing here is saying, oh, okay, the previous pointer points back to me, the next pointer also points back to me. And that way, when we go to insert something, it all just works, because our previous pointer will point back to this thing, and our next pointer will point to whatever the sentinel's next pointer was, which was itself, which is exactly what we want. And so the list always maintains that nice integrity if you just have sort of that dummy value there. By contrast, if I wasn't to use that sentinel, we would have had this nasty thing happen where basically we always have to check to see if previous and next were null because there might be nothing in the list, right? And so this gets us out of that. By making the list always circular like that, where it's got this sentinel that always completes the list, uh, it, it just gets you out of a bunch of checking. But yeah. All right, uh, so let's see what we've got here. Uh, load bitmap, uh, what happened there? I did not like that. Header, that is not a very good header, to say the very least. Oh, I know why. That is a very simple typo, and that is because when I was doing the allocation, I forgot to account for that. Uh, let's go ahead and make that acquire asset memory. That's total, right? Uh, like so, size total, memory size goes away, uh, and this guy is size data. So there we go. Uh, this is not particularly useful yet. Uh, you can even see the flashing. Can you see the flashing happening? Uh, that's uh, our asset system just evicting assets randomly, not in any particularly good order. Uh, but it randomly evicting assets to keep itself under the megabyte goal, right? Or whatever it was that we set, right? Um, oh, and one other thing I wanted to mention, right on cue, uh, 
Uh, the other thing that we have to do is we had locked assets, which are assets that aren't allowed to get evicted because we already planned for that, which is that the background, when background working tasks are using them. And so one other thing that we wanted to do is when we do add asset header to list, what we want to do there is make sure that we're never adding a locked asset, right? An asset whose final state is going to be locked. And so what we want to do is just pass that final state along. Um, in fact, you know what, when do we set that? When, when were we setting the locked? Were we never actually setting that? Correct me if I'm wrong, because we planned for this. We said we wanted to do that, right? Uh, and we had a locked, but I kind of feel like we never actually set anything to locked. Right? It never gets used. So we actually need the ability to set those things to locked. Um, I guess we'll leave that for tomorrow. But that is exactly what I was talking about. Let me see if I can get that to happen again. There you go. Uh, let's see here. So in, right, here's Phil ground chunk work. Uh, Phil ground chunk is just on a separate thread. So if we were to evict the memory that it was using, it will just straight up crash, right? So we can't ever allow that to happen, which we talked about when we did it and we introduced the asset state lock thing. But what we need to do, and this should be tomorrow's task for sure, uh, is we need to make sure that we actually lock assets down that are being used by the background task, right? That's just kind of an obvious, uh, that's just kind of an obvious thing that needs to happen. Uh, and so what we could do, you know, there's a pretty easy way, I guess, that we could do that too, uh, which is that we can, um, uh, inside our, uh, um, uh, inside our, our uh, well, you know what? We're way over time. I'm going to go to the Q&A, uh, but I will, uh, I'll talk about that a little bit later, how we're going to do that. I'll talk about that on tomorrow's stream. Uh, so yeah, I would say tomorrow, that's what we're going to do. I'll even write it down. Uh, tomorrow, asset locking. Okay. All right, Q&A time, Q colon in front of them. Uh, we kind of breezed through a lot of stuff on that stream. I just was kind of in the mood. So we maybe went a little bit fast. Uh, I'm just gonna talk about the linked listing a little bit here in the Q&A. Uh, but basically, so for a doubly linked list, there's really two flavors. Uh, there's Sentinel and non-Sentinel. Right, And so non-Sentinel just has like a first and a last pointer somewhere. And the first and the last pointer point to some part of the list, right? So you can imagine like, okay, I've got my list, right? Oops. Right. And what happens is the previous pointer of the first link points to null and the next link of the last, uh, the next pointer of the last link points to null and then first and last point to where they are, right? That's one way to do a doubly linked list. Uh, and that's just a lot more work, right? It's a lot more code to do that because you got to constantly check for the if, the if null, if not null, all that other stuff, right? The sentinel way is way easier. All that is is just says, okay, there's a sentinel. It's always there. It can't ever leave. Uh, however big the list is, right? Um, however big the list is, you just have exactly what you would expect always. Everything points uh, to its neighbor. So exactly the same structure uh, as before, no differences. The only time that something actually changes is the last pointer where this was null. It just points back uh, to the sentinel. And the pre pointer on the sentinel um, points all the way back to uh, that last link, right? And that makes the, links, the list circular. So now addition and removal is always the same. It's always looking at a case that looks exactly like this. 
because there's never a case that can't look like this. It always has a full set of pointers. And then <coughs> the first and last pointers are just implicit in the Sentinel. They are the previous and next pointer. The first pointer is the, is, um, sorry, the first pointer is the next pointer of the Sentinel. The last pointer is the previous pointer, right? Because, hey, if that's the Sentinel, the previous pointer always points back to that end of the list. And if it's the, you know, uh, if you want the first, you just look at the next, because that's whatever that was, right? So pretty straightforward. What function owns the pointer to the head of the linked list? Owns the pointer? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by owns the pointer. Isn't a linked list what you're always told not to do if you care about the cache at all? Uh, yeah. Um, basically, like, if this is something that you're heavily trafficking, you would not want to do that, right? Uh, are we going to heavily, tra heavily traffic it? Probably not, uh, but we'll find out. And like I said, linked list, I don't know that this is what we'll actually use. Um, and there's a number of ways that we can make it easier on ourselves uh, cache-wise too, if that makes sense. Uh, so like for example, if it turns out that we really care about the cache here, instead of allocating the linked lists here, we just allocate a block of the links and use them in one nice big block that's all cache friendly. Uh, but again, you don't really want to worry about whether your code is cache friendly if you don't even know if that code is actually running very often, right? Uh, so it's best, you know, you want to use data structures that are appropriate for the code that you're using, and you don't really want to try and optimize them until you know what you're actually doing, right? And so you'd want to, I wouldn't discourage people from using linked lists. I'd say use linked lists anytime you want. When you find that that code is slow, replace the linked list with something that's designed for whatever the, the thing is that you're doing, uh, designed to be faster, right? Could the platform allocate function allocate a few bytes more than requested and store the size there to avoid it being passed to the free function? Uh, yes, but I don't really like doing that because usually you do know the size, like in this case we did, right? Um, so I felt like that's maybe the easier way to go. Having a list header at the end of each asset struct, wouldn't that invalidate the cache a lot when processing the list since asset structs are potentially large? Uh, well, it doesn't really matter how big the, the uh, asset structs are. The cache is based on um, little chunks, right? And so, you know, touching a link that's at the end of the asset struct is no different than touching it anywhere else. So if you wanted to make this more cache friendly, the only thing you would really do for the linked list is you just put the links together. So basically, like right now, it looks like this, asset data, link, asset data, link, right? And so all you would do if you wanted to make this more cache friendly is you just grab all these links and instead just have an out of band thing, like a separate buffer that's just link, 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 link right? And that way, you know, you'd fit multiple of those in one cache line, right? But that's it. And remove asset header from list, would it make sense to zero out the prevent exporters of the header that's being removed? Or is that just a necessary cleanup? Um, it's unnecessary, but there's no reason you couldn't do it uh, just for um, like debugging purposes, right? So what we could do, right, is, is in here say, oh, okay, header next equals header prev equals zero. And that's just like a way for us to double check, you know, because it's not, this is not a high frequency operation uh, because if it turns out to be a high frequency operation, like I said, we'd probably want to not use a linked list if it turned out to be like a bottleneck. So I would, I would say that in general, you know, doing that's a fine way to do extra sort of debug checking. Will there be a fountain of heads somewhere in the actual game, possibly as a Halloween item? It does seem like a good idea. Is Twitch my full-time job? No. How will you re-enable the live code reloading after this is done? Uh, well, it's pretty easy to enable it if, even if we want to stick with this scheme. All you do is you uh, have the, the, um, uh, the loop live code editing. The platform code just keeps a set of uh, headers on the virtual allocs that thread them 
And when you do the save, you just go ahead and pull those, you, you write those out to disk. But I might actually even suggest not doing that and instead just invalidating the asset cache entirely whenever you do loop, loop live code editing. So that way we don't even have to store the transient arena. Um, so there's a lot of ways we could do it. But all that depends on us not actually just doing something slightly different than this anyway eventually, which is like just doing a block allocator. So, you know, I, I wouldn't worry about that quite yet. Can you briefly go over inline functions? Well, I don't know that there's that much to go over if, if you don't have a specific question. I mean, the inline function is just a function that you've told the compiler you would, you, it's like a hint to the compiler that says, this is probably something small that should just be embedded where it's called instead of actually making a function call to it. And that just allows the compiler, like it's a suggestion the compiler to take a look at it. And then the compiler takes a look at it. It will say, oh, I, maybe I can do a bunch of optimizations by embedding this code into where it's called rather than having it have to be a separate function. But it's unclear that really, like inline is just a hint. It doesn't force the compiler to inline it. So these days it's unclear like if you ever, if you even really care. I don't, the compiler can choose or not to, uh, to inline or not based on its own subjective judgment. And unless you use, uh, there's a separate keyword called force inline, which makes it mandatory to do so to the compiler. Uh, unless you do that, the compiler is actually is able to use its discretion. So when I type inline, it doesn't even mean the function gets inlined. Which classic data structure do you enjoy implementing the most? Purely subjective. Um, honestly, singly linked list is my favorite because it's so darn easy. It's kind of so breezy and fun. And even like some of the operations even just work with atomic exchange. Um, removal doesn't. I think removal requires atomic exchange and add. Uh, when I looked at that before, but like adding to a linked list, um, singly linked list is just an atomic exchange, which is kind of cool. Does will this system support hot loading of assets? Apologies if this has already been covered and I missed it. Uh, no, the system will not support that. Uh, strictly because we don't have any artists that work on this during the stream. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I guess I shouldn't really say it that way. It certainly does support hot loading if you wanted it to support hot loading because you just have, you just have some way that you wanted to grab like a bitmap, I guess, externally. Um, but yeah, I have no interest in supporting that for this uh, for the asset files, because the asset files are all basically come to me in batches from the artist, right? Uh, so we have no need for hot loading of any kind. Uh, but if you wanted to do it, it's trivial to do so, right? I mean, it should be really obvious how you would do it. Basically, like the stuff that loads a bitmap, we already had code in here before that loaded a bitmap right from a BMP. So all you'd have to do is just add the ability to say, okay, the asset file records the names of files it should look for. And then when you go to load a bitmap, you check to see if that file exists. And if so, you load it th from that instead. But uh, yeah, I don't have any interest in doing that because we don't have a use case for it, but you could do that if you wanted. Uh, let's see. Does it make sense to write your own non-block non-block dynamic allocator instead of using the memory system of the OS. Um, well, like I said at the beginning of the stream, I don't know that we're gonna use the OS as one. If in 64-bit, you probably just can. I don't really know though, I haven't tried. Uh, in 32-bit, I just think it'd be pretty dicey. So I suspect that that's the, you know, like I said, I just wanted to show how to get this working before having to tackle the memory placement part of it. Uh, because like you saw today, there's a bunch of other kind of futzing around that has to happen. So I would say, you know, I would say there's a very high probability chance that, that 
we would not actually call the, the platforms allocator, you know, by Friday, I think we'll probably be doing our own, right, is my assumption. But, you know, you don't have to do that. If, if you wanted to, you could try to ship a game that just did it this way, you know. So. All right. If there are no further questions... I will reserve the remainder of my time. Okay. Um, so yeah, we've got a bunch more stuff to do. We've only just gotten started on this, uh, but the week is young. Uh, we've got Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday to tackle this problem. So that is uh, a good thing, right? So let's go ahead and close things down here. Uh, go ahead and save. Lose. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining me for another episode of Handmade Hero. It's been a pleasure coding with you, as always. If you would like to follow along at home, you can always get the source code by pre-ordering the game. Uh, it comes with a source code, and I update it every night, so you can stay current and play around with the current state of the source code, experiment, and, you know, it's a good way to learn. We also have a Patreon page if you want to support the video series. You can subscribe there. If you would like to ask questions, we have a forum site, and it also has uh, community ports to Mac and Linux, uh, and it's got um, an annotated episode guide done by the community, all kinds of good stuff. So if you're trying to learn from the series, it's a good place to go. And we also have a tweet bot. So if you want to catch the series live, check out the tweet bot. It always tweets the schedule so you can keep up to date with when we are going to be on the air. Uh, if, uh, um, <clears throat> what was I going to say? I was going to say something. I don't remember what it was. You know what? I guess it doesn't matter. All right. So that's about it. We will be back here 5 p.m. Pacific uh, Standard, or sorry, Pacific Daylight Time tomorrow. Uh, 5 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time here on Twitch. So if you'd like to see some more uh, asset system work, we'll be doing that tomorrow, getting the locked asset stuff working, uh, and doing some more sort of cleanup of how we're doing stuff in the asset system. Uh, as we go towards getting ready to probably do our own block allocator uh, so that we don't call into the operating system for each allocation, which is, I really, I just don't think that's what we should do. Uh, but again, like I said, if that's what you want to do, uh, at least on 64-bit systems, I think you should have no problem doing the code like we did it today. Uh, but I just feel like there's, you know, maybe that's not the best idea going for 32-bit. For uh, we can test it, though. Anyway, that's about it for today. Uh, so hope to see you back here at 5 p.m. Uh, tomorrow. Until then, please have fun coding, and I'll see you guys on the internet. Take it easy, everyone.